1. Setting out. I hate travelling and explorers. Yet here I am proposing to tell the story of my expeditions. But how long it has taken me to make up my mind to do so. It is now 15 years since I left Brazil for the last time, and all during this period I have often planned to undertake the present work. But on each occasion a sort of shame and repugnance prevented me making a start. Why, I ask myself, should I give a detailed account of so many trivial circumstances and insignificant happenings? Adventure has no place in the anthropologist's profession. It is merely one of those unavoidable drawbacks which detract from his effective work through the incidental loss of weeks or months. There are hours of inaction when the informant is not available, periods of hunger, exhaustion, sickness perhaps, and always the thousand and one dreary tasks which eat away the days to no purpose and reduce dangerous living in the heart of the virgin forest to an imitation of military service. The fact that so much effort and expenditure has to be wasted on reaching the object of our studies bestows no value on that aspect of our profession and should be seen rather as its negative side. The truths which we seek so far afield only become valid when they have been separated from this dross. We may endure six months of travelling, hardships and sickening boredom for the purpose of recording, in a few days or even a few hours, a hitherto unknown myth, a new marriage rule, or a complete list of clan names. But is it worth my while taking up my pen to perpetuate such a useless shred of memory or pitiable recollection as the following? At 5.30 in the morning we entered the harbour at Recife amid the shrill cries of the gulls while a fleet of boats laden with tropical fruits clustered round the hull. Nevertheless, this kind of narrative enjoys a vogue which I, for my part, find incomprehensible. Amazonia, Tibet, and Africa fill the bookshops in the form of travelogues, accounts of expeditions, and collections of photographs, in all of which the desire to impress is so dominant as to make it impossible for the reader to assess the value of the evidence put before him. Instead of having his critical faculties stimulated, he asks for more such pabulum and swallows prodigious quantities of it. Nowadays, being an explorer is a trade, which consists not, as one might think, in discovering hitherto unknown facts after years of study, but in covering a great many miles and assembling lantern slides or motion pictures, preferably in colour, so as to fill a hall with an audience for several days in succession. For this audience, platitudes and commonplaces seem to have been miraculously transmuted into revelations by the sole fact that their author, instead of doing his plagiarising at home, has supposedly sanctified it by covering some 20,000 miles. What do we learn from these illustrated lectures, and what do we find in the travel books? We are told the exact number of packing cases that was required, or about the misdemeanours of the ship's dog, and, interspersed among the anecdotes, are scraps of hackneyed information which have appeared in every textbook during the past fifty years, and are presented with remarkable effrontery, an effrontery nevertheless perfectly in keeping with the naivety and ignorance of the audience, as valid evidence or even original discoveries. No doubt there are exceptions, and every period has had its genuine travellers, I could quote one or two among those who enjoy public favour at the present time. But my aim is neither to condemn hoaxes, nor to award diplomas of genuineness, but rather to understand a moral and social phenomenon which is especially peculiar to France, and, even here, has made its appearance only very recently. Twenty years or so ago, people travelled very little, and it was not halls like the Salle Pleyel filled to capacity five or six days running, which extended a welcome to tellers of tales. 
The only place in Paris which catered for this kind of thing was a small, gloomy, icy and dilapidated amphitheatre in an ancient building at the far end of the Jardin de Plain. There, the Société des Amis de Muséum held, and perhaps still holds, weekly lectures on the natural sciences. The projector, which was fitted with inadequate bulbs, threw faint images onto an over-large screen, and the lecturer, however closely he peered, could hardly discern their outlines, while for the public they were scarcely distinguishable from the damp stains on the walls. A quarter of an hour after the advertised starting time, the lecturer would still be desperately wondering if there would be any audience, apart from the handful of regular attenders scattered here and there among the tiered rows. Just when he was about to abandon hope, the lecture room would fill up to half capacity with children accompanied by their mothers or nursemaids, some eager for a free change of scene, others weary of the dust and noise outside. To this mixture of moth-eating ghosts and restless infants, the lecturer was privileged, as the supreme reward for so much effort, care and hard work, to reveal his precious store of memories, which were permanently affected by the chill of the occasion, and which, as he spoke in the semi-darkness, he felt slipping away from him, and falling one by one, like pebbles to the bottom of a well. Such, then, was the anthropologist's return, only a shade more dismal than the ceremony which had marked his departure. This was a banquet given by the Comité France Amérique in a mansion on what is now the Avenue Franklin Roosevelt. The building was uninhabited, and a professional caterer, hired for the occasion, would arrive two hours before and set up camp with his stoves, plates and dishes, and yet a desolate odour still hung about the place, in spite of a hurried attempt at ventilation. We all met there for the first time, we who were as unaccustomed to the solemnity of such a setting as to the dusty boredom it exhaled. We sat round a table which was far too small for the vast room, where there had been no time to do more than sweep the middle part which we were occupying. We were all young teachers who had only recently started work in provincial lycée, and, thanks to a somewhat perverse whim on the part of Georges Dumas, we were about to be translated from our damp and remote winter quarters, redolent of rum toddy, musty cellars and stale wood embers, to tropical seas and luxury liners, all of which experiences, moreover, were doomed to have only a very remote resemblance to the inevitably false picture we were already conjuring up, as travellers are always fated to do. I had been a pupil of Georges Dumas at the time when he was writing his Traite de Psychologie. Once a week, I cannot remember whether it was on Thursday or Sunday mornings, a group of philosophy students met at the Saint-Anne Hospital, in a room with one wall the one opposite the windows, completely covered with gay paintings by lunatics. In that room, one already had the sensation of being exposed to a peculiar kind of exotic experience. There was a platform on which Dumas ensconced his sturdy, angular frame, crowned by a knobbly head resembling a large root that had been bleached and stripped through a long stay on the seabed. His waxy complexion created a unity between his face his short, white, bristling hair, and his goatee beard, which was also white, and sprouted in all directions. This curious piece of vegetable flotsam, still bushy with little roots, was suddenly humanized by the flashing of coal-black eyes, which emphasized the whiteness of the head. The opposition was continued by the contrast between the white-starred shirt with a turned-down collar and the broad-brimmed hat, the loosely tied bow and the suit, all of which were invariably black. There was not much to be learned from his lectures. He never prepared them, since he was aware of the physical charm exercised over his audience by the expressive movements of his lips, which were twisted in a constantly flickering grin, and above all by his voice, which was at once hoarse and melodious. It was a real siren's voice, with strange inflections recalling not only his native Languedoc, but, even more than any regional peculiarities, certain very archaic musical modes of spoken French, so that the voice and the face conjured up, in two different sense registers, the same single, rustic and incisive style, 
the style characteristic of those 16th century humanists who were simultaneously doctors and philosophers, and of whom he seemed to be, both physically and mentally, a descendant. The second hour, and occasionally the third too, were devoted to the presentation of various patients. This was the occasion for some extraordinary performances involving the crafty practitioner and certain inmates who, after years of confinement, were well used to this kind of drill, knew what was expected of them, and could produce symptoms when required, or would put up just enough resistance to give their tamer the opportunity for a dazzling display of skill. The onlookers were not taken in, but willingly surrendered to the pleasure of watching these demonstrations of virtuosity. When a student attracted the attention of the master, he was rewarded by having a patient entrusted to him for a private interview. No contact with savage Indian tribes has ever daunted me more than the morning I spent with an old lady swathed in woolies who compared herself to a rotten herring encased in a block of ice. She appeared intact, she said, but was threatened with disintegration if her protective envelope should happen to melt. At once a scientist, and something of a practical joker, as well as the instigator of broad works of synthesis, which remain subordinated to a rather disappointing critical positivism, Georges Dumas was a man of great nobility. He gave me proof of this later, just after the armistice and shortly before his death, when he was living in retirement in his native village of Lédignon. Although almost blind, he made a point of writing me a kind and discreet letter, which could have had no other object than to affirm his solidarity with the first victims of the political events of the time. I have always regretted not having known him in his youth, when, dark and suntanned like a conquistador, and full of enthusiasm for the scientific possibilities opened up by the psychological theories of the 19th century, he had embarked on the spiritual conquest of the new world. His relationship with Brazilian society was to be a case of love at first sight, by virtue of this mysterious phenomenon, two fragments of the Europe 400 years ago, certain essential elements of which had been preserved, on the one hand in a Protestant family of southern France, and on the other in an extremely refined and rather decadent bourgeois society leading a slow existence in a tropical environment, came together, recognised their affinity, and were almost fused one with the other. Georges Dumas' mistake was that he never realised the profoundly archaic nature of this coincidence, the only part of Brazil which succumbed to his charm, and a brief period of power was to give this part the illusion of being the true Brazil, consisted of landowners who were gradually transferring their capital to partly foreign-owned industrial investments, and who were trying to provide themselves with an ideological cover in the form of an urbane parliamentarianism, it was precisely these landowners who were bitterly referred to as the Gran Fino, the upper crust, by our students, who were themselves either of recent immigrant origin or the children of minor resident landowners who had been ruined by the fluctuations in world trade. Strangely enough, the founding of Sao Paulo University, Georges Dumas's greatest achievement, was to allow these students of humbler origin to begin their social ascension by obtaining qualifications which opened the way to administrative posts. Consequently, our university mission helped to form a new elite, which was to turn away from us to some extent, because Dumas and, following him, the Quai d'Orsay, refused to understand that this elite was our most valuable creation, even though it was trying to overthrow the feudal landlords, who had certainly made it possible for us to come to Brazil, but had done so partly so that we could give them a cultural front and partly so that we could provide them with entertainment. But on the evening of the Franco-American dinner, neither my colleagues nor myself, nor our wives who accompanied us, had any inkling of the involuntary role we were to play in the evolution of Brazilian society. We were too busy watching each other and trying to avoid possible social blunders, for we had just been warned by Georges Dumas that we would have to prepare ourselves to lead the same kind of life as our new masters, that is, become habitué of the automobile club, casinos, and racecourses. This seemed extraordinary, 
to young teachers who had previously been used to earning 26,000 francs a year, and it still seemed so even when we were given thrice that salary because so few people wanted to go abroad. The main thing, Dumas had told us, is to be well-dressed. And to reassure us, he added with rather touching innocence that we could rig ourselves out very economically at a shop called A La Croix de Jeunette, not far from Les Halles, where he had always had very satisfactory service when he was a young medical student in Paris. Chapter 